This part of the session is uh, with myself. I'm Tim Kuklo. I work at the Denver International Spine Center and then also Sue Gooden, who is uh, owner and CEO of Progressive Health, who's also here. And uh, there's a balance to the information we provide and that's the purpose of it. A couple note-taking sort of uh, announcements. Number one, we want to really thank the Arthritis Foundation, who we've partnered with before in seminars like this. The Arthritis Foundation obviously is well known and it's part of what we do and part of what we take care of is technically arthritis of the spine. So we want to thank them for that partnership. So uh, I'm going to start and talk about the back or the lower back for the most part, the, the lumbar spine. Wushik, Dr. Chung and uh, Jen in the other room talked about pain management in the, the neck and cervical spine more. We're also going to talk a little bit about scoliosis and then modalities because it's all about finding the right balance for everyone of what works for you. Not everything works for you, and certainly it's not about surgery. So first goal, what do we really want in life? Well, we want to work, provide for our families, we want to play, we want to have some fun, and we want to live pain-free. So everything we do is somehow linked to improving the quality of life, and that's our goal. You know, it's not about narcotic medications or a surgical procedure or anything. It's about improving life. So any of the questions, any of the modalities that we do provide something. And if it's incremental and we combine several of them, that's important. On the true sort of Western medicine side of things, we often start with imaging. And some of these imaging, you know, are somewhat well known to the population. Some is not. Here you see plain x-rays, an MRI, and a CAT scan which is also a myelogram, which is dye in the canal. And each of these are meant to provide a working diagnosis, a nomenclature, some means of finding what the real true pain generators are. And unfortunately, there's a thousand words out there. And I've got people that come in and say they fractured a disc, or they broke their back, or they have, have some term that comes from nowhere, either or from sometimes some health provider that didn't really know it. So the reason we do that is to communicate with ourselves and communicate with you, provide knowledge so you can go home and Google it or whatever else you do. And so what we do is we get the terms like degenerative discs or spondylosis, which is also arthritis of the back. We also have scoliosis or a collapsing spine. And scoliosis is just a curvature. And it's very, very, very common. In fact, over age 60, 15% or almost one-sixth of the population has some form of scoliosis. It's because our discs wear out, because we age. Every morning we wake up, we're a day older than we were yesterday. Think like that. And so eventually things wear out. We also come up with terms like vacuum discs. And on imaging, essentially it's these black areas where there's no disc left anymore. It's just air or gas that we see on, on, on films and studies that show that that disc is essentially gone, and it certainly is thought to be a large pain generator. We also see spondylolisthesis, which is a Greek term just meaning spine slippage, which is like here, where you can see this one is slipping forward of that one. Very, very common. Also prevalent in about 15 to 20 percent of people over age 65. So very common among us all. My father has it. My mother has degenerative scoliosis, and my father has spondylolisthesis, and that's not why I'm short. I'm, <laughs> so I'm kidding. We also have facet arthropathy, or the joints are wearing out, or muscular strains, or, str or, or spasms, or sprains, or all kinds of uh, uh, terms around that, and finally stenosis. And most of us have heard the word stenosis, and it just means narrowing. A great picture of narrowing is when you see an MRI and there's no white that goes through, or you see a myelogram where the dye, there's this white is dye, a contrast, and it gets cut off and you don't even see it flow past. And that is very significant. It leads to significant issues of back pain, leg pain, and even upper extremity stuff. So the purpose of that is to throw the terms out. And our job in the next three hours is to make sure that all those terms are up front, we explain them, we talk about them, and we, we find means means to uh, address them and help you. So that's sort of the terminology. So then, what's really new? So if you look at science, and you also look at the metaphysical side and the spiritual side and the holistic side, 
the expansion of our knowledge and understanding in the last 20 years is significant. I'm going to speak more to the science side. I think Sue's going to talk more to sort of the science and general health and metaphysical and spiritual sides of things. But if we look at this, our understanding of science has greatly expanded, especially in physiology, diet, medications, general health, and expansion of these basic science applications, specifically in robotics. We now have machines that help us with prostate cancers and prostate surgeries and cardiac surgeries and even spine. We now have fiber optics and the fiber optics are getting so specific that we can do things we never imagined before and pretty soon we'll go be wearing a pair of sunglasses that does everything for us. Our biologics understanding, our ability to grow bone, regenerate tissues, material sciences in terms of materials and plastics and things like that have allowed us to put joints in over the last 30 years or 40 years to do things in the spine and other areas of the body we never thought possible. Pharmacology is rapidly expanded, and then nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is taking something this big and making it so infinitesimal we can't see it anymore, and now having little nanotechnology uh, medicines throughout our body. But that's where we're going. Now I'm going to take some of that and try to put that together and sort of talk about our spines and our back and arthritis of our back and pain and cover these three areas. Life and preventive care exercise and physical therapy sort of things and I'm not going to I'm just going to have a slide and then let Sue go into depth on most of these things and then some of the advanced interventions and where we're going in the future now conceptually from that they're all separate but theoretically really what we're doing is we're combining all those because if you have a good healthy lifestyle it's not like you're exposed or or separate from exercise or or health or or walking or a physical therapy or a weightlifting program or even sometimes the need for advanced interactions and they they often overlap to get us forward so think like that we need some of all those to move us forward so let's go with number one lifestyle and preventive care and we'll hit these five topics so first one is health awareness and smoking now I came from the Army, I'm retired, and the first thing that you remember from the first day you're in and the first break you get after that road march is smoke them if you got them. And if you served in the military, you heard that a thousand times. In fact, the young population of soldiers, sailors, and airmen that joined the military, there's an increase of smoking because of the culture. But we also know over the last 20 some years that smoking has many more problems, many more downsides than just lung cancer, what we see. As far as the back goes, it leads to degenerative discs. It leads to wearing out of the, of the bone. It is strongly associated with low back pain. In fact, those that smoke have far more 50% back pain than non-smokers. Blood supply and nutrition goes down and nicotine affects the signals. It's a receptor. So every cell in your body continues to turn over throughout your entire life. And there's a receptor on every cell, just like the outlet in the wall, and it gets plugged. And as that smoking, continuous it blocks that so we have to have those cells regenerate and get away from that we know it impedes everything from turnovers of cells to perception of pain to the healing process and then pain increases and the perception of pain and the looping of that just continues and bleeds over into the ability to relax during the day to sleep at night to oxygenation to every cell so the effect is global and if you smoke my job is to partner with you to try to get you to understand that to move you forward. If you don't smoke, then my job is to scare you away from it. But in general, we need to understand that it's a significant impact. Second health awareness is diet and nutrition. We have a nutritionist out here with progressive health and we want to use them. We want to understand that. But from my perspective, nutrition and health is something that is significant. We know that plant-based diets can help us reduce inflammation. We have more and more knowledge every day on inflammation. We also know that Losing the proper weight helps us for our posture and our positioning. And, and as a take-home message, over here in the box, the force across your lower back, to include your knees, is over four times your body weight with certain motions. So what does that really mean? We know that certain things like this are really bad for us. Or even certain occupations are bad for us, right? <laughs> However, if Santa loses 10 pounds, just 10 pounds, he takes 40 pounds of force off his back. That's like me carrying a sack of potatoes or something across my back weighing 40 pounds every day because that's what my discs see. So if I lose that extra 10 pounds, 
my back, my pain, my, what I'm carrying around with me, I can take that army rucksack off and start to help my back. So weight and proper nutrition and inflammation in what we eat and the, the, the knowledge of what we're going for with this and inflammation is significant. And that's why you have a whole specialty built around that. And that knowledge continues with inflammation. What about medication? So Jen Graff's gonna talk about medications on the other half over there. She's gonna get into CBD oils and THC and all these things and narcotics and opioids. And everyone knows now that there's a crisis because we see it on channel nine every week. Nonetheless, they're only for temporary relief and they have tons of interactive side effects. Literally from our immune system to our testosterone levels, to our GI tract, to our psychological profile but we'll let her get into that. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about osteoporosis and treatment and prevention as well. And when you look at this, the guidelines have changed. So calcium is absolutely important. You know, when we look at uh, weak bones, we need three things. We need hormones, we need calcium, we need, well, vitamin D with there, and we need some type of exercise. We need resistive exercise as well. So when I look at calcium, the recommendations are a minimum of 1,000 milligrams a day, which is better to bring naturally. Now, when we look at that though, we know that the certain age groups need more. So women over age 50, do not raise your hand. We know that you need probably 12 to 1300 milligrams a day once we get older, and sometimes you'll hear up to 15, but 12 to 1300. We know that teenagers need 12 to 1300. And if you ain't getting in your diet, we need to supplement that. And everyone asks, well, which is the best supplement? Well, the best form is thought to be calcium citrate, which is C-I-T-R-A-T-E. Now the reason calcium sit was it's a little bit more expensive than some of the other sort of forms that we uh, purchased, but calcium citrate is thought to be a little bit easier as we age because of the acid or acidity of our stomach changes. So as we get older, even more important to look to the citrate as your supplement uh, of choice if you're going to supplement calcium. So that's a good take home as well. And then estrogen is important, and of course I know there's side effects with that, and there's issues with that, but still we need that. The other medications are, are these series of medications, actinil, boniva, phosphonate. They're in the bisphosphonates, and they're side effects. And there's a, one out of 100 has more side effects than benefits. But overall, all of these medications have significantly impacted us or helped us sort of fight some of the severity of osteoporosis. And if you don't believe it, you should see someone who comes in with severe osteoporosis and they age much quicker and it's much more damaging to their activities of living and their impact and quality of life than even cardiac disease at times if you have it. I just saw a young lady who's uh, 33 years old who just had a baby and she had a very rare phenomenon of severe osteoporosis postpartum. And her DEXA scan and her studies are well up over like an 80 year old lady. And so these medicines can help us if properly treated and if properly diagnosed. And the purpose of that is to slow our bone loss and or maintain it. And some of them, such as Forteo in the bottom down here, which is a parathyroid hormone, hormone, has the ability to actually increase our bone density or our strength of our bone. It's not for everyone, it's just part of the whole process. What about vitamin D? Vitamin D has become hot over the last 10 years or so. We know when we all grew up, we needed 400 IUs, or international units of vitamin D. And mom told you get outside and get the sunshine because it made our bones healthy. We know that, but even living in Colorado, closer to the sun, we do not get enough sun to convert to vitamin D. Very important to understand. The deficiency of vitamin D is linked to cardiovascular disease, heart problems, depression, diabetes, and believe it or not, mental acuity, especially in males. Of course, you guys know that if you've been married for more than 25 years, that's probably the happen what's happening right there. But nonetheless, <laughs> this is my wife every morning. Bone pain, muscle pain, weakness, fatigue, mood swings, sleep problems. We know that vitamin D alone can do that. So when those things happen, it's part of that regimen. It's part of understanding what's happening to us, and it's part of something we can easily correct. Vitamin D is something that costs about $6 a month to fix. My young associate, 30 years old, also was diagnosed with hypo or low vitamin D, and she corrected that as well. So it's an important product. And it's found in many natural foods, such as fish and fish liver oils, egg yolks, fortified dairy, grain products, etc. So these recommendations are somewhat hold the day. Old standard is 400 IUs, now we know at least 1,000 to 2,000 IUs. And some people are up to 5,000 a day to catch up and get them back to a normal level. 
Very important in our process. Exercise and physical therapy is our second group today. And I'm going to cover these topics in that. So the first one is musculoskeletal health. The reason we do exercise is because the bone remodels. So everything we do, walking around, slight resistance exercises, cleaning the car, vacuuming, etc. Any type of activities, resistant exercise, anything our bone sees as a force, it responds through life by continuing to build up bone. If you start to lay down, you get sick, you don't get out of bed for a month, you start to have muscle mass wasting and you start to have bone loss. And the reason that is is because it's a constant remodeling system. So the purpose of that, the importance of that is i.e. move the joints, but also to build up strength, resistance, and uh, basically build our framework. Low impact alternatives are also important to understand because I always hear, well, I'm not a runner. My frame wasn't built as a runner. Well, at five foot four and a hundred and too much, my frame isn't built for that either. But there are alternatives, walking, stationary bikes, swimming, elliptical machines. There's things that all of us can do regardless of age. And it's important to keep working that way, to start this cascade, this rebuilding process of our skeleton throughout life. Strength training also maintains the muscle mass, as I said before. It helps with posture and core strengthening. And especially because of this. This is our modern day worker. He's not on the farm. She's not in the factory. We're doing this. And this leads to incredibly poor posture, incredibly poor muscle tone. We've lost our ability to do some of this stuff. Talk to our therapists. We have a wonderful group of therapists at this hospital that do this every day and that they teach, teach, teach. And we've lost that. It's hard to get it back, but it's important to kind of understand. Next one's yoga, which I'm not going to get into. And then Pilates. And I think of them as sort of similar, but different. Depending on what type of yoga, yoga is stretching, flexibility, balance, depending on which type. So if you're a yoga instructor, I don't want to step on your turf. Pilates to me is a little more extension based, core maintained first and then flexibility. And so they're somewhat different. I actually think the combination works great and I love Pilates for spine problems. I really do. So we can get into that and we can get into the specifics of that. We have experts here that do this every day. Acupuncture is Sue's area. I believe in it. It's part of the regimen. It's part of having that tool belt with a bunch of tools all over it. And I don't pull that same tool out for every patient or every problem. I, I, I sometimes go to this tool or that tool or occasionally a tool off here. And acupuncture, which, which helps those meridians, those pain generating processes to help reduce is important to understand as well and part of the regimen. And to further that, physical therapy does a similar form of that called dry needling. Everyone wants to know the differences. That's a hard one to answer exactly, but I would say the basic way to putting that, it's like bud and bud light, okay? <laughs> Coors and Coors light. It's kind of more like that, okay? Acupuncture, dry needling. Acupuncturists are much more uh, trained, much more understanding of some of the processes. The physical therapists are great at it, but it's, it's sort of like a Bud Light mentality. And manipulations are great. There's nothing wrong with chiropractic manipulations or osteopathic manipulations, but occasionally they're not good. If you've got a giant herniated disc, most chiropractors or osteopaths will stay far away from that. And the purpose of that is because you can make someone worse. And there are documented cases of someone having a herniated disc in their neck that just got really bad and became quadriplegic. So that's not a scare tactic. It's just knowledge. Again, it's back to that tool, tool belt mentality. Is that the right tool or the wrong tool? And think like that. Last is advanced interventions or areas that people have a lot of questions with. Steroid injections, bone cement, they've heard about that. And or is there some type of surgical procedure. So in steroid injections, steroids are really anti-inflammatories. This is not the NFL. This is not WWF. These are corticosteroids, which are anti-inflammatories. And if they place in the right place, like a smart bomb does, then that allows us to decrease inflammation at that area and move on. And they're particularly effective when we combine them with other modalities, like therapy and other type of options here to keep people to move forward. We want to address a symptom, calm it down, move forward, get better. That's kind of the way to do it. You just don't get the injection and think you're going to walk out of there and be better. My dad gets injections. He walks in. He calls me up and says, I'm not completely better yet. I said, you know, come on. You know, you got to do something here. And my dad is like, you know, 84 and works like a horse still. So he gets it, but it's not something that's magical. We need to use those again as that supplement. And they're very good. The side effect of steroids, you can only have so many. 
and they're a little bit different than trigger point injections. So if you're going in every week to get 17 trigger point injections three times a week for the next six months, something's wrong with that. Something's not doing good medicine. You're not moving forward. The, the injections aren't your answer to everything. So just think about that. We can answer more of those things as well, but we use these as adjuncts, and there are very skilled individuals that do these every day. Bone cement. I get this one a lot. Can I use bone cement and take all my bone pain away? Well, bone cement is pretty good for some things, specifically a compression fracture. A compression fracture is something like a fracture, uh, the vertebral body, especially in the spine, where it, the architecture just doesn't hold it, and, and it's common. And if you have an osteoporotic compression fracture, you have something like a 30% chance to have another one within two years. Now, occasionally, we treat them with bone cement, which is sticking a needle in there and, and literally putting a material that's as, as hard as a rock and it, when, it, when it dries, it's like that. The problem with that, the good about that is it can take some of the pain away from the fracture. The bad about that is that puts force here and there and there and there and you have a chance that that could even lead to the fracture of the next level because osteoporosis just doesn't affect this vertebral body. It also affects that one and that one and this one and that one. And so it is an adjunct for occasional use. It is not the answer to a lot of things. And we'll go through that more if we need to. The terms out there are called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. These are the way they're, they're quoted or marketed or we communicate on. The third one is minimally invasive surgery. There's a lot out there. One of the most important things is surgery is not always indicated. In fact, anyone that walks in my door as a spine surgeon specialist, it's about a 10% or less chance that we even think it's applicable for you. So nine out of 10 people walk away with a referral to someone else or a lifestyle change or something else. Less than 10% is a surgical match and or something that we wouldn't try anyhow. We would try all these other things. The word minimally invasive just means we make very small incisions. In other words, things that are meant to get that way, but it's not always as, as marketed. Remember that. You'll see that on the, on the news. You'll see that in the airport. You'll see that on that plane about the Laser Spine Institute. And we'll get into some of those things. And there's some good they do but it's not always exactly as market and it's not always your answer. And remember, not everything is right. You know, McDonald's is not hiring losers. They're trying to hire closers, I think. So when we look at that, the basic side of that with surgery is basically we want to do something with the least damage, with a tube, with this incision that's as big as my finger if I can, and do something that helps fix a local problem if we can do that. And that's where the answer to that is. It's not all about all the other stuff. So please understand this is not a seminar about surgery. Sometimes surgery is indicated and if you do go down that path it's 50-50. You got to work just as hard as I do. It can't fix this. It just can't fix that. This is scoliosis. This is a very aged old spine as one gets older that was neglected as, as we grew up. And so you know I can't fix this with incision through there. No one can. There's ways to do things. There are sometimes indications for other options. So where's the future and where are we going? So a couple slides on that as far as what we're going to go in terms of what about all these things I read on the internet? What about this? What about that? First of all, genetics. We now are testing adolescent kids who have a family history of scoliosis to determine if they're more likely or not to have a progressive scoliosis. We're getting to that sophisticated level. You can now do online, whatever, send in a swab from me from your mouth and figure out what your genetic basis is. I get that. In fact, most people are kind of surprised that they're not 100% Italian, that they're really, you know, 82% Polish or something like that. And then that's disappointing because they have trouble with light bulbs. But beyond that, <laughs> the genetics will get better and better. We will understand our genetic profile further. We'll keep going down about that, but we're not 100%. Second is biologics. We see a lot on biologics now. Anything from fusion, we're able to grow bone biologically. From something outside of you, we can grow bone. We can now repair tissues. We have evidence of liver regeneration. We have evidence of cardiac muscle regeneration. We have this technology, but we're still working it. If you know, have a family member with a spinal cord injury, everyone goes, looks, it, looks up the, the literature, they come into my office and say, what about stem cells? Can't you inject the stem cell into that spinal cord injury and repair it? The answer is today, no. If you go to Brazil and spend $10,000 on it, the likelihood of that happening is, is close to zero. I'm not saying miracles don't occur. I'm not saying that 
There's not some type of divine intervention sometimes, because I actually believe in that too. But right now, for the average person, we're moving forward rapidly in this, very rapidly. But right now, if I had to put my money onto it, I probably wouldn't do that. So let me kind of explain that to you. Stem cells are basically a type of cell that's in our body. We all have them. And they can differentiate, which means they can form a, 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 a heart cell, they can form a bone cell, they can form a muscle cell. And at certain times, they're attracted to different areas of the body to help it rebuild. If I take that from somewhere else, they can help regenerate the damaged tissue, but it's not perfect. It's obviously we keep aging, right? And if I take it from outside, then there's embryonic tissues and fetal tissues and fat cell tissues and, and joint tissues that it all comes from as well. And sometimes embryonic or fetal cell becomes more theoretical and there's some religious based and theological based issues with that in some people and sometimes not. And those cells are really good at this. But today, September 23rd, I had to think about it, 2017, we're going fast, but we're not there yet. And so if this was me, I wouldn't waste my money on this yet. We're getting there. And it's going to help some of our sports medicine injuries. And you can go spend a lot of money on that right now. And they can pull blood out and spin it down and say, there's your stem cells, and inject it back in to fix something. And sometimes it helps. But right now, the scientific evidence and our techniques have not caught up yet to spend your money. That's my opinion. I'd like to keep going forward in that. And I've done a lot of this have a lot of the basic research in it as well. And then what about these other technologies? What about the VAX-D decompressions, which are three to five thousand dollars sort of stretch you and then you get up and walk around and the stretch doesn't last anymore? Or these ARP wave electrical stims or disc replacements, motion devices, X-stops, spinal cord stimulators and lasers. Each one of those has some benefit and some non-benefits. We have a program here with spinal cord stimulators that are fantastic, that take away some of the chronic pain in the leg or chronic pain in the back, and they work fantastic, but not perfect. We have laser surgery and in, in, uh, a lot of marketing on that. I've also seen people come back from laser spine surgery and have such searing leg pain because the laser hit the nerve and it created inflammation around it, and it's terrible pain. So all of these have some. Caveat emptor. You know what that means, right, Bonnie? Buyer beware. <laughs> Just remember that. You know, you're no different. You're a consumer. You don't go onto the parking lot and buy that first little yellow Yugo that you came to because it just can't be that good. So beware. Gather knowledge. My job is an educator. I'm supposed to educate. So you come in my office. My job is to teach you what you got in better English than that and educate you of all these options and what's your chance of success and where you're putting your money down and get you a better life. So think about that as you get out there. So that's what's out there. Remember, the tool belt. If my only tool is a hammer, everything comes with a nail. If the only thing I talk about is surgery or if the uh, laser or the ARP wave thing is the only thing I'm doing and there's a cell on you, at some point you've got to have a deep breath, walk away, gather information, seek a second opinion.